I was going to, uh, while they were still alive and gagged, I was going to uh, drape them over the bathtub and cut off their head. And uh, then hang them there and let the blood all drain out, good and drained out. And I was going to keep the body around for a couple of days. I was going to set the head on my desk so it could, like, watch me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, keep the corpse in my bed, sleeping with it, having sex with it for a day or two. And then I was going to start butchering them and cooking them. So. Ten-year-old Jamie Rose Bolin was born August 7, 1995 to Curtis Lynn and Jennifer Fox in Edmond, Oklahoma. A few years after Jamie was born, her parents separated but co-parented. Her mother Jennifer lived out in Guthrie, Oklahoma as a tractor-trailer rig driver, and her father Curtis moved out to Purcell, Oklahoma as an auto mechanic, where Jamie attended Purcell Intermediate School as a fifth grader. Her father described Jamie as having the most infectious laugh who loved to pillow fight with her younger half-sister. According to her friends, Jamie was a shy girl but loved meeting new people while always seeing the good in people. They also observed that Jamie never fit into just one group and never had anything mean to say. Jamie's family remember her as an amazing and avid reader with so many awards to show for. She was also said to love singing, playing with dolls, sewing, watching movies, and riding four-wheelers. Nothing short of a bubbly young girl. However, on Wednesday, April 12, 2006, Jamie went missing. She was last seen playing a computer game with a classmate at a local library before biking away back home. When Jamie's father, Curtis Bolin, returned home from work and noticed Jamie was not home, he worried frantically about her whereabouts. Her mother Jennifer was chucking when she received a phone call from her father who told her Jamie had gone missing. Curtis, along with the Purcell Parks Department manager Tim Bayer, knocked door to door within the complex to search for her. Around 6 p.m. they reached apartment 115, where 26-year-old Kevin Underwood stayed, to ask him about Jamie. They recalled that Underwood appeared sleepy and said he last saw Jamie riding in the breezeway headed towards the library. He proceeded to say he would love to help them, but he was tired and had work the next day. The following day, police issued an Amber Alert for Jamie, adding that her kidnapper might be a sexual predator. Afterwards, witnesses called in who claimed to have saw Jamie enter a Chevy Tahoe that day with a Texas tag and a Fox illustration in the back window, and also provided a sketch of the possible suspect. Two days after Jamie went missing, hundreds of law enforcement officers are searching for her at this point. They even begin searching the computer in the Purcell Library to see if she arranged a meeting with someone online. Police are routinely stopping cars at a checkpoint, which is the protocol for Amber Alerts. Around 3.45 p.m., FBI agent Craig Overby stopped a truck with two men and asked what they knew about Jamie's disappearance. One man said he heard about the disappearance and in fact his son, who was in the passenger seat, was their neighbor. In that moment, Agent Overby remembered hearing that a neighbor might have been the last person to see Jamie. He then asked the son, who was 26-year-old Kevin Underwood, to come over to his patrol car and talk for a moment. During their conversation, the agent flagged some responses from Underwood as suspicious and took him in for questioning. At the end of the short questioning, they asked Underwood if they could take a look at his apartment, and he readily agreed, and so they followed him back to the Purcell Park's apartment. Once inside, Agent Overby noticed a large plastic container that was taped shut and walked over to look into it, but it was at that point Underwood said, go ahead and arrest me, she's in there, I chopped her up. As they were leaving apartment 115, Underwood began hyperventilating and said, I'm going to burn in hell. Underwood was arrested two days after Jamie's disappearance. The Amber Alert was canceled and a press conference was issued that same evening. Once Curtis Bolin, Jamie's father, had heard the news, he had collapsed and his brother took him to the hospital where he had to be sedated. His mother Jennifer said that Curtis's whole life revolved around Jamie. He didn't go out and party. He didn't drink or smoke. This had probably destroyed him. Jamie was actually supposed to see her for the weekend to go Easter egg hunting together. It would have been her mother's first time seeing Jamie after two months. Kevin Ray Underwood was 26 years old at the time of Jamie's murder. 
born on December 19, 1979, to Connie and Larry Ray Underwood. Around age two, his aunt discovered that he was different. He did not respond to hugs and did not play with other children. Throughout school, Underwood was described to be a loner and kind of a sponge who would absorb all of the bullying as it was not in his nature to fight back. Some months before Jamie's murder, he told his supervisor that he only had a phone for his computer because nobody would ever call him. Underwood worked nearly nine years at a Carl's Jr. restaurant. His co-workers described him as a quiet, boring, and seemingly trustworthy young man. His boss, Bill Burden, said Underwood kept to himself and carried out his job very well. He even gave his wife multiple ride homes from work and his daughters felt comfortable around him. Underwood lived in the same apartment complex as Jamie and her father. Actually, he lived right below them. He knew Jamie. In fact, he used to carry his pet rat on his shoulder and let her pet it. Just the night before Jamie went missing, Underwood allowed her to use his telephone to order pizza. Apartment manager Tim Bayer said Underwood typically stood outside of his apartment and watched children. Oddly enough, Underwood's mother Connie described Kevin as a wonderful boy. Additionally, he had a seemingly clean criminal history. To say this was a shock to his family and those who worked around him was an understatement. More shocking, authorities got a hold of his blog with the username subspecies23. A few years before Jamie's death, in September 2004, he wrote, My fantasies are just getting weirder and weirder. Dangerously weird. If people knew the kind of things I think about anymore, I'd probably be locked up. No, probably about it. I know I would be. A year later, in September 2005, he described himself as becoming, quote, more and more detached from the world, end quote. Through his blog posts, it became evident that he had cannibalistic fantasies and feelings of isolation, depression, and even homicidal thoughts. Meanwhile, funeral services for Jamie Rose Bolin were held on Thursday, April 20th, 2006, at the gymnasium inside Purcell High School. Nearly 1,000 people were in attendance. She was buried at Summit View Cemetery in Guthrie, Oklahoma. While searching Underwood's apartment, authorities seized a dagger, duffel bag, a videotape about a serial killer, a hacksaw, meat tenderizer, and barbecue skewers. Once detained, Underwood said that he'd planned this murder for a month and initially plotted on an adult woman or a five-year-old boy within his complex, but chose Jamie as she was an easy target and often came around. What you're about to hear is Kevin Ray Underwood's twisted and cannibalistic murder fantasy. Viewer discretion is advised. Now, going back to um, the plan, you, uh, yeah, so, you had the handcuffs from the duct tape. Yeah, so what I was going to do is I was going to, uh, you know, like I said, yank him in there, restrain him, and if, if it was a kid, I was going to just make them sit there and watch some porn first. And then I was going to have sex with him. And then... Were you going to try to make it turn them on with the porn and make it voluntary? I was, you know, kind of hoping that would happen, but I you know, figured it probably wouldn't. So you assumed that you would have to do it by force? Yeah, mo most likely. Okay. And then... You know, the uh, after the sex, it would turn kind of violent. I'd start to kind of torture him a little and stuff like that. Uh, How would you torture him? Uh, In your fantasies, what would you do? Sticking large objects in their anus, uh, causing them pain that way. I had some uh, long barbecue skewers I bought. I was going to poke through their cheeks. I've got a... Uh, in that bag of porn, there's also a Barbie doll head I found on the ground a while back that I stuck some needles in. Kind of illustrates what was in my fantasy. It had like some needles in its cheeks and some nails in its eyes, but I wasn't intending on doing that because I... The, 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 the uh, torture was kind of a late addition because at first I wanted the body to be pretty much unharmed. Because uh, what I was going to do after that then was I was going to... Uh, while they were still alive and gagged, I was going to uh, drape them over the bathtub and cut off their head. And uh, then hang them there and let the blood all drain out, good and drained out. And I was going to keep the body around for a couple of days. I was going to set the head on my desk so it could, like, watch me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, keep the 
corpse in my bed, sleeping with it, having sex with it for a day or two, and then I was going to start butchering them and cooking. Chop the head off and maybe cook them and stuff. What, what would you, could you continue on from there? Uh, well, uh, then it went into you know, disposing of the body. I was probably going to keep the skull. Uh, but then, you know, I was going to pretty much eat everything except for some of the organs and those I figured I could, you know, put it in a trash bag and probably throw away without too much uh, chance of getting caught. Uh, and uh, so basically all that'd be left was bones. And I was going to uh, try to, you know, break the bones up into little pieces so they wouldn't be as visible and, you know, dump them in a ditch somewhere. Once Underwood established 10-year-old Jamie as his victim, he described multiple opportunities to carry out the murder, including the night before when she used his phone to order pizza. Yet, he always found himself pulling back. The following Wednesday afternoon, once Jamie had biked home after school, she went upstairs and changed, and then bumped into Underwood as she was going down the stairs. He then invited her inside his apartment to see his pet rat, and she followed him in. What you're about to hear is Underwood's confession to Jamie's murder. Viewer discretion is advised. Anyway, she came downstairs and was still, you know, she's like, oh, there's nothing when it's this hot, nothing good, like a good, you know, ice glass of ice milk. And uh, she, you know, kind of chatted for a minute and then asked to come inside and see my rat again. And... She just sat there on the floor uh, looking at my rat, and uh, about the only TV I ever watch is cartoons, Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon, and SpongeBob was on, and so she was kind of sitting there watching that, and we were talking about the show a little, and she was in my apartment probably a good 15 minutes, and uh, after she'd been in there a few minutes, you know, when she first came in, I was like, oh, now's my chance, but, you know, then I had the same, no, I can't do it, and I just kind of struggled with myself the whole time she was in there. And uh, it was partly because, you know, uh, you know, I can't do this, I don't want to do it, but then, you know, yeah, I want to do this. And there's a little bit of fear, like, hey, if I do this, I might get caught. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, that was a large part of it, too. But, um, but anyway, and then I even had, uh, I had all the stuff, I'd had all the stuff sitting there handy uh, on that, uh, you know, entertainment center right by my door. I'd had, uh, you know, like for the last month, I'd had... Uh, piece of duct tape stuck there so you know I could just grab and slap the tape over their mouth and also the handcuffs sitting there on the shelf so you know I could yank them in and restrain them hopefully before they had the time to yell or anything and uh oh and also it had been just uh two or three nights before that I you know suddenly thought of the uh it was mainly something I had reserved for if I did grab an adult something to subdue him I tried to find something heavy I could hopefully with and the best thing I had was a uh, slightly heavy wooden cutting board in the kitchen. So I had that sitting on the entertainment center at that time, too. And after she'd been in there a few minutes, I kind of... So it'd be ready so you'd have it exit right there at you? Yes. Yeah, so just kind of like yank them in and whack them over the head. Okay. So, but I hadn't planned on doing that if it was a kid, because if it was a kid, like I said, I wanted to keep them conscious and make them watch porn. Uh, but uh, I even also kind of... You know, uh, also was as they were watching the porn, you know, depending on how old they were, you know, like telling them what was going on. You know, like, well, this is sex. You know, the guy does this and the woman does this, and you know, this is called an orgasm. You know, kind of like teaching them, but um, and hopefully they'd want to try it for themselves, something like that. Uh, but anyway, then uh, you know, so I kind of once she got in there, I kind of was like, you know, you know, it was, it was more the the, uh, you know, kind of regrets and fears, and I was like, you know, I better just knock her out, you know, knock her out, and, you know, then restrain her while she's unconscious, you know, get her clothes off and everything while she's unconscious, and I'm not even going to bother with the porn, I'm just going to, you know, knock her out and rape her. Uh, so, uh, after she'd been in there a few minutes, I kind of, you know, made my way around behind her and was just kind of standing behind her, watching, you know, talking to her as we were watching the show, and kind of, you know, fighting with myself. I'd, I'd grab the, uh, I, you know, reached up there once and grabbed the uh, cutting board. And, you know, then I, like, put it down on the couch. I couldn't do it. And so for, like, five minutes, I just stood there, you know, going back and forth, picking it up, putting it back down, and saying, you know, and finally I was just, you know, look, either do it or 
tell her to get the hell out of the apartment, and, you know. And finally, I did it. And, you know, as soon as I hit her. What did she say when you hit her? That's something that's, you know, haunted me ever since it happened. Uh, she started yelling, I'm sorry. Which, you know, I'm just like, you know, what is she sorry for? She didn't do anything wrong. It's me, you know, I'm the one that should be sorry. She was just, you know, why, well, you know, after that, she, uh, like I said, she jumped, she was yelling, uh, God, I'm sorry, and, you know, uh, you know, let me go, I won't tell. And, you know, I mean, after I hit her a couple times, I finally just had to, you know, jump up and grab her, and she was, I couldn't believe how strong she was. I barely held her down. Uh, I finally, I like to never got her down to the ground. I mean, I had, to, uh, you know, how I, I didn't want to choke her, because like I said, I wanted the body to be pretty much perfect. Uh, so I didn't want to leave the, you know, marks around her neck or anything, so I just, you know, climbed my hand over. Were you behind her? Or were you looking, yeah. were you on, did you have her on the ground? No, I was, uh, like I said, uh, she got up and was trying to run around, and I, you know, grabbed her from behind, was kind of hugging her with her mouth over her, her uh, hand over her mouth and nose. And eventually, you know, after she started getting weaker and stuff, and, I mean, we flopped around. I've got pretty bad carpet burns on my knees from it, because oh, yeah. I said she put up a... Is that, is, is, and just for the, for me to understand, let's see, this is your right leg. You know, the, it's on both of them, but this one's the worst, so... So you were wearing shorts at the time? Yeah. And you're telling me this is from the incident with... Yeah. Okay. Because you were on... Yeah, it's from str struggling... You were struggling with, on Yeah, struggling with her on the ground, because then, yeah, once I, uh, you know, I finally got her down to the ground, I finally got her, you know, I mean, we struggled it. It took me probably 15, 20 minutes to kill her, uh, to get her completely dead. Because then even after, well anyway, I you know, struggled with her for a minute, finally got her down to the ground on her stomach. And so I was kind of sitting on her back, you know, with my mouth over. Or, no, she was on her back, yeah, but I was sitting on her, clamping my mouth. My so hand she was looking down at her face and you were covering her mouth. Yeah, nose. kind of sitting on her not really putting my full weight on her, you know, kind of like on my knees with a little bit of my weight on her stomach to hold her down. And, uh... Did you feel aroused at that point? Very, yeah. By the time I... By the time uh, I got done killing her, uh, you know, my underwear was soaked. You know, when, when you get aroused, it'll start, you know, kind of leaking a little. Oh, Pre-ejaculation. Yeah, it was, uh... I was, my underwear was pretty much soaked by the time she... Uh, well, even before she was completely dead. But, so, did you tell me you were sexually gratified during this? Struggle. Pretty much. Yeah. Did you have an orgasm? I didn't, was it just I, I didn't or orgasm, but I was, you know, very, very erect. You had an erection, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, just standing there behind her debating on killing her or not, you know, I've started to get an erection. Uh, but anyway, yeah, then she still, I mean, once she was down on the floor, she kept me you know, almost slipping out of my grip, and she ended up. She ended up, yeah, on her stomach at one point. Yeah, she ended up on her stomach, because I remember, uh, there's a toolbox sitting there by the edge of the uh, uh, love seat. And, you know, as kind of in like her last moment, she just started, started kind of reaching around, grabbing things, and she like opened that toolbox. And then she pretty much went limp. And I laid there on her for a good, you know, couple of minutes more to make sure she was dead. Cause she'd still, every now and then, because, uh, you know, clamping through your, she, she can still get a, kind of a little bit of air sometimes through her fingers if my grip slipped a little bit. So I laid there for a while. and. Finally, was pretty sure she was dead. Flopped her over, and then about thirty seconds later, she took a breath. Hmm. So I had to jump on her and do it again. It took probably several more. You know, it's probably wasn't as long as it seemed like, but it seemed like it took her another five minutes to get her limp. Then, and then finally, when she was, I was pretty sure she was dead again. I uh, jumped up and grabbed the duct tape and put it over her mouth and nose because I was getting tired. My arms were getting sore from clamping so down on her for so, so long. Get, I was like... Right. Dropped her over the tub, you know, over the... She was out of the tub with, you know, just like her head, you know, over the edge hanging into the tub. And I, you know, kind of got there. I put a rubber band in her hair so it would be out of the way and... Because I didn't even want to... Uh, like I said, I wanted the body perfect and clean. I didn't want it get blood all in her hair so I'd have to wash it and everything and uh, so I started sawing at her neck and I, I couldn't believe the amount of blood that came out of a girl that small and it was already all clotted and everything was it going down the drain of your uh, tub I had a bowl a big 
you know, white ball. It's in the kitchen in front of the microwave. I was going to collect, try to collect, uh, you know, a lot of the blood in that, probably taste of it. And uh, but then when it started coming out, you know, it was, you know, pretty much hard to get to go where I wanted it. And like I said it was already all dark and clotted and gross looking anyway. So. Uh. So you. You had trouble sawing her head off. Yeah, yeah, that's what yeah, I was trying to remember where I was. Yeah, I went, you know, got, I guess, to her spine, and I just saw it and saw it and saw it and could not get it at last. And I was pretty much exhausted by then. And, like I said, you know, as soon as I hit her, you know, I wished I hadn't started this, but, you know, as soon as I hit her the first time, I was like, well, now it's too late. I can't stop now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was the only reason I even went through with any of it. And then, like I said, you know, I was disgusted at first, but then once I was climbing down on top of her, holding her down, choking her, I got aroused again. Okay. Uh, but so at this point, yeah, I was just disgusted as I got this mess. Because I couldn't even keep the blood in the tub. It was running down her and right down the side of the tub into the floor. And you know, I was like, you know, at this point, I just clean up this mess and get the body out of here. I'm not even going to have sex with her. Okay. And so I was already pretty upset. You know, I can't believe I did this. Wish I hadn't did it. You know, wish I could take it back. Right. To put it shortly, Police Chief David Tompkins said, regarding a potential motive, this appears to have been a part of a plan to kidnap a person, rape them, torture them, kill them, cut their head, drain the body of blood, rape the corpse, eat the corpse, and then dispose of the organs and bones. The case was moved from Purcell to Norman, Oklahoma due to its extensive pretrial publicity and to seek an impartial jury. On February 29, 2008, it only took 20 minutes of deliberation for the jury to find Underwood guilty of first-degree murder. Although Underwood fought against the death penalty, he was sentenced to death by lethal injection. Nearly all tenants of the Purcell Parks apartment, where Jamie and her father and Underwood lived, have all moved out following Jamie's death. Three weeks after Jamie's death, her father, Curtis, left Purcell, Oklahoma, and moved closer to where she was buried out in Guthrie and battled depression and nightmares. Jamie's mother, Jennifer Fox, moved from Jones, Oklahoma, to Oklahoma City and lost her job as a trucker two weeks after her death. Kevin Underwood, now 41, still sits on death row at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary.